the cathedral, um, it just was bigger than any church that I'd ever been in. Um, and when I look back on it, it was like a, a gothic, a gothic jewel on the landscape. You can see it from way down the end of the town, then down Victoria Street. One of the good things about it was it had wonderful acoustics, beautiful um, resonance in there. My grandfather built the original altar. I was only a little girl, probably four or five, and I used to polish the suits with my hanky. The, the cathedral at the time had these rows of columns, all like a, like a miniature Gothic cathedral, which was typical of many parish churches in the country of Western Australia and our other states. The building, in order for the, for the lime, they blasted down on the limestone rocks in the back beach. They then manoeuvred it up over the sand hills and with bullet trains of, of their own manoeuvring on top of the hill. And my grandmother Bridget Banting, she would cook for the people that were working up on the, the um, church site. And my father-in-law told me that as an altar boy, he, like, and, and it's been reported by many other people, that they were carrying bricks up from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill to help the builders, because there's no bobcats in those days. So the development of it was, in terms of plan, was quite spectacular. But as always, the work was often largely done at a local level. And so from 1919 was the planning about this church, and it was finally opened in 1920. So there's a great range of photographs that deal with the site and it's being prepared. A procession carrying the Blessed Sacrament from the old church up the hill to the new church and the day of opening. and even a major shot of a, the band, the parish band that they put together to accompany the procession up the hill from the old church. Bunbury became quite prominent in the 1890s when the railways started to be developed through the district. So by the early 1900s, Bunbury was a major region, regional centre. This church was likely to become a cathedral, so it was rather grandiosely built given the population of the time on top of the First World War. Like anything that was a, a major undertaking, the parish priest at the time, as Dean Smythe, he had a certain vision in the sense of presuming that at some point Bunbury could well be a major centre and possibly even the see of a diocese. St. Patrick's Cathedral was somewhat an expression of the theology of the time, no matter what the struggles we're going through, to have a sense of something greater, something beyond something, beyond our own limitations, that would also be part of the faith of our fathers to be, to be kept going very strongly. And then we arrive down there and of course as we come into town, from a particular approach into town, he said, there's your cathedral. And there it was, of course, and one of the high spots of the Bunbury town. And uh, uh, suddenly I realised, well, this, is, this is my place, this is my sacred site from now on. There in that cathedral, 
was the center of my, my energy and the center of my perseverance and I believe the center of my guidance in making decisions for the good of my people. A few days after I was ordained, uh, I took possession of the cathedral and the cathedral was a statement to me of faith and love. Uh, for example, how it was built, children, there wasn't a road there, children bringing up the bricks two at a time, dads building it themselves um, and it was a solid looking building and uh, so it was, a, it was a strong statement I think of, of the faith of the people in the past. The Catholics were always renowned for getting close to heaven where they built their churches. <laughs> but it, in Bunbury in particular, it tested the faith and, and, and sprightly legs of the elderly to be able to get up that hill. Getting up to the cathedral was walking uphill. And if you were in any way tired or in any way rushed, you had to just move a little bit more quickly. Father Leon was here, well he was, um, yeah, he had the, the entire place painted, including the spire. And it, I think it really started to look beautiful then to the entire town. It was the building in which, in which they worshipped. It's a building of great significance, emotional and spiritual. It's a building of significance even to people um, who weren't Catholics but came up the hill in a time of crisis and used to sit there and just find some peace. It was not like normal howling wind. It was, it was a completely different tone. I can't even describe it. It didn't sound like a, a train the way some people are describe it. It was really a, a malevolent, evil sort of noise. We came out, saw the trees down, there was no lights on, there was people everywhere. And we just went, it couldn't happen. It just couldn't happen. And it was unbelievable. The, the storm on the May the 16th touched down approximately about 6.30 a.m. When I went out, there was no anticipation of actually the damage done by the tornado. It was just like Iraq. You know? To me, I've never been in a war-torn country or anything like that, but it looked like a bomb had hit. In the, the case of the cathedral, we had the upper section listing over because of the force, but in addition to that, it physically lifted off and, and moved sideways the brick buttresses by 30 millimetres. Forces of, of hundreds of tonnes in a vertical upward direction. There were people milling around. Um, the priests were naturally in shock. Shortly after seven, and Bishop rang me and said, can you get in here as quickly as you can? It looks like a war zone. I suppose we, we saw the initial cracks on the exterior of the building um, where it had sort of lifted the building and put it back down and, and moved it you know, over an inch. Um, and that was at sort of chest high along the, the northern part of the, of the cathedral. And you thought, wow, geez, it's moved. But you didn't know, you know, you, we're, we're not engineers and we didn't know what the implications of that were, were and also how it had happened. We entered into the cathedral and, uh, and viewed the internal damage. It was quite clear that the damage was very extensive at that time. Um, there had been large deformations in the upper level of the building. Uh, we were immediately aware that there was a risk of collapse at that time and we advised everybody that there was, a, there was this risk of collapse and nobody should enter the building without authorisation. You know, the engineer said this when they came back and they said, there's more cracks appearing, I think it's a moving building. That's when we realised we've got to shut this down. So we, you know, we had to get security in. We then 
came to the conclusion that demolition was the only appropriate course of action for the main cathedral section um, and we were monitoring the condition of the tower. Uh, we assessed the, the resultant damage to the tower and determined that there was a safety issue whilst we were removing the main body of the cathedral. We were concerned that the tower could collapse because of the, the cracking that had occurred. You have those people nearby who, um, whose parents and grandparents built it. So their reaction uh, you know, brings back a lot of memories and a lot of sadness that the cathedral is no longer there. You know, because of the memories that had happened in there, whether they'd been baptised, married, buried, you know, the loved ones from, from the cathedral or whatever, there was an attachment there, an emotional attachment, and that had been lost and that had gone. The first thing that fell off was the spire, and it was like watching someone you really love die. It certainly affected me. A lot of people said, you know, when you actually see it come down, it was. That was, that was the time that was probably the most emotional. So this, the method selected was to tie large cables through the building. In the main body of the cathedral, we, we wrapped them around the, the main supporting columns, draped the cables through the windows. And then with a large excavator, we were able to pull them from a safe distance of about 30 metres away, causing the, the roof to collapse inwards and implode with everybody safely at a, a safe distance of 30 metres or more. I mean, you know, there were parishioners we saw in cars lined up on the street, you know, we we're, were crying. But, you know, out of adversity comes opportunity and it was soon after that, you know, that we could move on. Obviously, it's a it's a long, hard road ahead. Um, it's uh, some many some great challenges, particularly with the emotion and uh, and uh, you know the fact that the, the enormity of what we've got before us is it, it just can't be underestimated. There's not too many cathedrals in the world get built every year. The eyes of the world really are on Farnbury because we're you know we'll be the the latest diocese building a new cathedral.